For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. Humans are forgetful creatures, and I think we all recognize that. Our brains are amazing things, but as humans, we often tend to forget things. You might have forgotten where you left your phone, or where you left your car keys. You might have gone to a concert, then left the concert and completely forgotten where you parked your car. You might have forgotten the name of your English teacher from 7th grade. You get the idea. We cannot remember everything, and there are details of life, even if they were pretty significant at the time, that we end up forgetting and that end up being lost. However, there are certain things that no healthy individual should forget. We're assuming that, assuming you don't have something like dementia or CTE or Alzheimer's or some condition with your brain, that you remember the name of your significant other. You remember the street that you live on and your address. You remember your family members. And you remember where you work, and you remember the place that employs you. It would be pretty hard to go through life and not remember where exactly you work. It'd be kind of awkward if you worked at Target and one day, you went to Walmart thinking that you worked there, but you didn't. And then the next day, you went to your local grocery store thinking that you worked there, but you don't. You get the idea. When it comes to your literal place of employment, there are certain things that you should not forget. Speaking of things that you shouldn't forget, don't forget to hit that like button down below, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss a single video that we post on the channel. We post every single day about the weird and wacky history of the NFL, so if you like that sort of stuff, then this is the place for you. So subscribe down below, and help us reach 60,000 subscribers. Thanks in advance for your support. Well, I bring all of that up, because the man you've been watching this whole time is a wide receiver by the name of Dick Compton, and he completely forgot what team he played for. And I don't mean that he accidentally said in a press conference that it was an honor to be playing for one team when he meant another, and he just had one of those brain farts and slips of the tongue. No, I legitimately mean that he showed up to camp with one team, not realizing that he was a member of another team. Imagine if Trevor Lawrence just showed up to camp with the Carolina Panthers or something like that. That's what happened here. Because in 1967, Dick Compton thought that he was a member of the Pittsburgh Steelers, even though he was most definitely not. And this is the bizarre story behind Dick Compton, as in, the wide receiver who forgot what team he played for. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, and just how insane it was, we need some context to understand who this man right here, Dick Compton, is. Right now, you're watching a clip of him with the Houston Oilers, which is one of a handful of teams that Compton was on beforehand. After Compton was on the Detroit Lions for three years before getting cut, he signed with the Oilers in the AFL, who had a coach on their team by the name of Bones Taylor. Compton played well over the second half of the 1965 season with Houston, even catching this 96-yard touchdown in a game against the Buffalo Bills and he looked to feature heavily in the offense in 1966. However, the Oilers got a new coaching staff that year, with Hugh Taylor being replaced as the head coach by Wally Lem. And Lem didn't like Compton so much at wide receiver, converting him to cornerback instead. This didn't go so well, and by the end of the season, Compton was rotting on the bench with the Denver Broncos. The situation was so bad in Denver, due to Compton's lack of playing time, that he told the team after the season that there was no circumstance in which he would report to camp in 1967. With that, the Broncos granted Compton his release, and Compton became a free agent. And with Compton officially on the open market, there was one team that made a ton of sense for him to go to. That team? The Pittsburgh Steelers, where the wide receivers were being coached by none other than Bones Taylor, so that natural connection was there. The Steelers needed some help at wide receiver badly after trading away star wideout Gary Ballman to the Philadelphia Eagles. And when Taylor mentioned to head coach Bill Austin that if there was a receiver who was a free agent and could probably help the team out, quite bluntly, Austin said, get in touch with him. That was easy enough, seeing as Compton wrote a letter to Taylor saying that he wanted to get back in the NFL, and if there was a way for him to play, he would do it. 
With that, the Steelers ended up signing Dick Compton and converted him back to his natural position of wide receiver, which meant that Compton was getting another chance to keep his professional football career going. So you would think that this would be the end of our story, right? Pretty quick video. After being released from the AFL, Compton signed with this team behind me right here in the Pittsburgh Steelers, got to reunite with coach Bones Taylor, and got to play his natural position of wide receiver. In a normal world, that's the end of our story. However, there was just a, one small problem with all this. There's just one teeny tiny problem that we need to address that, I don't know, it seems like a small detail, might be a bit of an over-exaggeration on my end, probably not huge in the grand scheme of things, but, oh yeah, that's right, the Pittsburgh Steelers did not own his NFL rights. Because remember how I said that back in 1965, Compton signed a contract with the Houston Oilers of the AFL? Turns out, he also signed a contract to play with the Atlanta Falcons, who would be starting in the NFL the following year in 1966. Now, there was absolutely nothing in the rules against negotiating with teams in two different leagues, especially since the merger had not happened yet, and there was nothing that said that Compton couldn't play with the Oilers in 1965, especially since the Falcons weren't even a team yet. However, by signing the contract with the Falcons, it meant that the Falcons owned his NFL rights. This meant that Compton could play in the AFL as long as he wanted to. However, if he wanted to play in the NFL, unless the Falcons released him, it had to be with the Falcons, which makes sense. Because, you know, that's how contracts work. Yet somehow, this man right here, Dick Compton, completely forgot that he signed a contract with the Atlanta Falcons. He completely forgot the fact that when he went to the Steelers, he was not allowed to do that, because another team owned his rights. Said Compton, I kid you not, I had completely forgotten about the contract. Seriously, Compton forgot about the contract, which, I don't know, seems like a pretty freaking big thing to forget, especially since it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things. There are some things from two years ago that I definitely have forgotten. You asked me what I was watching on TV on this day two years ago, and the outcome of the game that I had on in the background? I probably don't remember. You asked me what song of karaoke I did on this day two years ago, and I probably don't remember. You asked me what case I read for law school, I probably don't remember. Having said that, if I signed a contract to play professional football, and presumably talk to coaches and a bunch of people before that, oh, you best believe that I will remember that. You better believe that I would remember the team that I played for. And somehow, Dick Compton did not remember that. Somehow, he just forgot about that small little detail. It's like Olivia Rodrigo, how she just tripped and fell into his bed. Dick Compton just tripped and signed a full-fledged contract with an NFL team and completely forgot about it. Whoops. And regarding what happened with these two teams behind me right here, after word got to Atlanta via newspaper articles and other league reports that Dick Compton was in training camp with the Pittsburgh Steelers, you can imagine the reaction of the Atlanta Falcons, because they, uh, they did not take it too well. And that's putting it lightly. The Falcons had one of the worst passing games in football in 1966, so any receivers who could help in that department would be, well, helpful. And you're telling me that one of those players, a man that we own the rights to, just forgot that he was on our team and reported to the Pittsburgh Steelers instead? Yeah, that didn't go over so well. Because by the second week of training camp, Steelers head coach Bill Austin got a strongly worded letter from Atlanta saying, Hey there, buddy, uh, what you doing? Compton is our player. Austin had no idea about Compton's contract with the Falcons, which makes sense, because Compton didn't even realize. Earlier in camp, when Austin talked about his team's receiving prowess for the 1967 season, he said, we also have acquired Dick Compton from the Detroit Lions, who knows how to run patterns. So not even he recognized the fact that Compton was on the wrong team. And when Compton found out that he was on the wrong team this entire time, he was, understandably, confused and upset. It all came rushing back to him and he remembered, 
Oh yeah, I, I did do that thing I met with those coaches and signed that contract. Oh yeah, that was a thing that totally happened. Said Compton, It shook me up a little, because I liked it with Pittsburgh so well. I didn't want to have to leave. However, Compton would have to leave the Steelers, and Pittsburgh wasn't arguing it whatsoever. By rule, Compton was a Falcon. He signed a contract with the Falcons. They owned his rights. There was nothing that the Steelers could do to keep him at this very moment. That is, except for one thing. What's that one thing that they could do? Well, generally speaking, how do you acquire the rights of another player when they're with another team? Simple. You make a trade. It could be kind of costly, but it could very well be worth it. Especially because the Pittsburgh Steelers view this guy as a starting wide receiver, and they did not want to lose him. If they couldn't acquire Dick Compton through free agency because he wasn't a free agent, then they were going to acquire him another way, by compensating the Atlanta Falcons. And with that, Compton was able to stay with Pittsburgh because immediately after the Steelers and Compton found out about this Falcon snafu, the Steelers decided, screw it, we're not going to fight this at all because you're well within your rights to do this. Let's work out a trade. And the Falcons, surprisingly generously, accepted a sixth round draft pick for Compton, which the Falcons would use on South Carolina State defensive back Joe Wins, who never played it down in the NFL. So good job, Falcons. You really nailed that trade. Atlanta easily could have gotten more for Compton, seeing as the Steelers wanted him and were practicing with him as their top wideout following the loss of Gary Ballman. The Falcons easily could have strong-armed the Steelers into more, especially because this was a time of crisis for Pittsburgh when they found out completely out of nowhere that their top wideout was not really their player. But nope, just a six-round pick, that's all. And just like that, Dick Compton, despite being a Falcon and completely forgetting the fact that he was a Falcon, was able to stay in camp and remain a Steeler. Almost like one of those feel-good kids movies where the kid is having such a great time at his friend's place and doesn't want to leave and go back to his parents. So the friend's parents just decide to adopt him and everything works out in the end. As for how Dick Compton would do in Pittsburgh, he played two seasons with the Steelers and while he didn't do a lot in 1968, hanging it up after the season, in 1967, he was a very solid wideout. He had 42 receptions for 507 yards finishing second on the team in both of those categories, and actually finishing the season inside the top 20 of the entire NFL in receptions and inside the top 25 in receiving yards. In an amazing piece of irony, he had more receptions and more receiving yards than any single player on the Atlanta Falcons did during that 1967 campaign. I'm sure the Falcons were absolutely kicking themselves over that one. So what's the moral of the story here? I think it should go without saying, but if you sign a contract to play for a team, then guess what? You are a member of that team, and that team owns your rights. If you sign a contract to do something, then you are legally obligated and required to do it. It shouldn't be rocket science or this foreign concept, but apparently, when it came to the man you've been watching this whole time in Dick Compton, it was. There are certain details in life events that you should probably not forget, especially if you are still working in that industry. And signing a contract to play football for a team when you are a football player is definitely one of them. Because even though the logo of the Falcon shaped like an F stands for Falcon, on this day in 1967, it stood for forgetful. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL Trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.